Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Curry. In my podcast, I interview extraordinary people and pick their brains. Each episode will feature a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a different perspective on the many paths that can lead to a rich and fulfilled life. This includes their favorite books, morning routines, exercise habits, trade secrets, nutritional philosophies, and their overall take on happiness and success. My goal is to find out where those amazing people get their holistic results from, so that you and I can use their tactics and go kick ass in life as well. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. First question that I would like to ask you is, if people ask you what you do, what do you say to them? I always say that I'm a physician um, and that I do mostly research at this point, although I do see patients. Um, but I train where, where my training, I was clinically, I used to be more of a primary care physician. So, um, that means just like a, a general physician. I don't know what you, how you call it in, in uh, Germany. Um, but I now do more specialized care around metabolic syndrome and obesity, which is really goes very well with my research. So it, it, um, it actually works better for me that way. Fascinating. Why obesity? What motivates you to look into this field of, of uh, disease? So actually, when I first started doing research, it was more around tobacco and smoking cessation, um, and um, which I was very interested in. I, I, I kind of, when I started doing a fellowship in general medicine, I started working with somebody who was doing tobacco, and I sort of, as a the, my mentor, sort of led me into that field, which was consistent with my interest in prevention, but. Um, I, I kind of had a, a revamping of my uh, uh, career, like not so much my career, but as in my interests. Um, I've always been interested in healthy lifestyle since I was a teenager. Um, and so I think that I just felt that the um, obesity epidemic was m more compelling to me. I thought there's and I really the reason that I think it's so interesting is because it's so uh, it's made up of so many components. It's there's. There's the, obviously the biological, but there's the the social, the environmental, the psychological. There's so many. There's the policies. Um, it's so such a diverse field, and I think that all of the, those pieces are important. And so, as a as a researcher, that's what makes it really interesting to me. This was I listened to an interview with the Harvard Catalyst, where you were with a guest on an interview, and. My favorite moment was where you talked about the magnitude of the task that is at hand because right now I just finished a chapter about environment in my in my book, The Behavior Architect, and I'm just overwhelmed how defenseless normal people who don't study behavior psychology are against our design as a society. And can you elaborate a bit on that? How is how is it for you to go through a mall or to a normal street? Like how do you What's that experience like? Well, for me, I mean, I'm so tuned into it, so I know kind of um, what the triggers are. But I mean, we're all vulnerable to it. Um, you go into the gro the grocery store is the classic example. Like, I mean, we're all vulnerable to those special the specials that are at the end of the aisle. That's like, you know, or if it's something's on sale, um, if you if it catches you in the right moment, you go and you're hungry or you. Like for me, if I knew my kids were all going to be home and they think it was really a great treat, then I, you know, I'd be much more likely to pull it off the shelf than if I was going in there and I didn't happen to see that item. So it, it does, it, even, even for people who are hyper aware of their, what the environment's doing, you, you're still vulnerable to it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not thinking about it, you're, you're really vulnerable to it. One of the questions that I had for you is in Germany, I don't know if this is the same case in the United States, but in Germany, when you go to the checkout where you, where you pay, this is where all the cigarettes are, the sweets, yeah. the tobacco, and even, even alcohol. And we sell small yeah. doses of alcohol. And like as a, as a guy who's interested in behavior design, this, this drives me nuts. Can you tell a bit about that? What's the mechanism behind that in your opinion? 
Well, I think, I mean, it's the same concept as the thing, everything on the, the end of the aisle. It's, it's, it's directed towards impulse buys. So in the U.S., we, we can't, we're not allowed to do that with cigarettes and, and alcohol now. Oh. But there's plenty of candy and unhealthy sweets in checkout count, at the checkout counter. Um, so, uh, and I think that this is one of my arguments about food. I mean, in the U.S., a lot of our policies or, or local, some local and state policies address the placement of tobacco in stores. So I, I, in my opinion, we should be able to start to address some of these food items like sugary beverages. They shouldn't be right at checkout. They shouldn't be right in places where people are going to make an impulse buy. Um, you should have, you know, you could have water or something else there if somebody's thirsty. Um, but people are buying things there that they weren't planning to buy. Um, so uh, I think that we can do a better job. And we We've started to in certain areas around tobacco and alcohol, um, but uh, I think we could be starting to move that way with food choices. I listened on your podcast with uh, Harvard Catalyst that you propose a system where you uh, put different colors on, on food items. And yeah. in Germany, something awesome mm -hmm. happened is that we, we used to have very bad meat, like low quality meat. And now we have a system in some supermarkets where there is a rating from one and it's, it's like the lowest of the low, like where the, yep. the animals have done, like it's just cruel how they went up. And four is green and it's, it's amazing to see because now at those supermarkets, like the green stuff, even though it's more expensive, is always sold out and there's just this huge chunk of, of meat, which is nobody wants to buy anymore because now you can, uh, this is a system we actually understand. Right. And I think to me, I always say this, there's nothing that's more powerful than a red label. So the, when people see red, they just, they want to stay away from whatever it is. And so in our, in our, in our system, in the cafeteria, the green means it's a healthy choice. We based it, we based the, the, the whole system off of the, um, USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture food, um, uh, uh, food guidelines. Um, and so green is a healthy choice. Red is an unhealthy choice. Yellow is somewhere in the middle. And so um, I think that the green label is good. People should know what's healthy. But a lot of like st um, grocery stores will label what's healthy for you, but they don't let label what's unhealthy. And so you can go into denial about these unhealthy. You say, oh, all right, I know that's healthy, but I'm going to get this other item. And you don't even think about what it is. If it had a red label on it, you wouldn't even consider grabbing it. Um, so I think that the, the traffic light labels, the red, yellow, and green labels have this really emotional component to people. Like you see it and you feel something right away. And that's what, that's part of, I mean, it works because it's telling you what's healthy and what's not healthy, but it's also this reaction you have to that color because that color means something to you. So that's why I think it's particularly effective. That's beautiful. Um, was there something from your personal life that motivated you to, spend so much time and effort in fighting for educating people on this topic because for myself like my father is a long time smoker and obese and i just think there's such an amount of unnecessary suffering that i'm going to lose my father like 20 years 30 years prior to what life normally would have taken from him and for in exchange for something that is not very big in my opinion so is there yeah. something that motivated you for it? You know, there's no one moment or one, you know, experience that motivated that to me. I, I think it's, it's truly something I've always believed in, even since I was a kid, that um, I like to exercise. Um, I don't, you know, I've always exercised almost every day. Mm. And I, I feel good. And I know that it's good for me. Like, so I really believe in that. Um, and I believe that the good quality food makes you feel better. And, um, and I'm just, I'm very much, uh, interested in prevention and avoiding medic, you know, I think medications have their role for many, many situations, but I think that we are too quick as physicians to just put people on medication rather than take the time to talk to people about living a healthier lifestyle, which is causing a majority of the problems people have. Particularly in Germany, the way we treat depression, for example, is almost 
purely biological and we are we kick people out of psychiatric facilities if they don't take their antidepressants even though it's it's worsening their symptoms so there is a lot of work uh, for our nation ahead of us and was there a particular mentor or something that motivated you to focus on on this area to dig, dig a little bit deeper You know what? No, there wasn't. I, I actually, this is something because when I, at the time that I switched from focusing on tobacco, this was, I, I did it because that's what I was interested in. Mm. And I didn't really have a particular mentor that was saying, this is a good field for you. Because it, it's just something that I have believed in. And um, I've always, I've wanted to sort of figure out the way to, to make the most impact. And to me, it's through these public health type of interventions or these these environmental interventions. That's how I sort of evolved into this field. Because actually what I do, most of my research is, has nothing to do with medicine. It has to do with prevention in the environment. It, it's not in the doctor's office at all. So I think that I just tried to figure out like where it's, it's I don't know what, I, I actually can't say there's one reason why I was interested in it. It's just who I am. Could you tell me a little bit about your current projects? The big project, and actually we just had a um, paper come out this week, um, has been enrolling, um, it's more doing more work with employees. So we've enrolled 600 um, employees from the hospital into a study to do a randomized trial of sort of a behavioral nudging um, intervention to get them to make healthier food choices and healthier diet. And so the purpose of this research is kind of to take that whole environmental traffic light labeling thing one step further because I think that our our prior work with the traffic light label shows that we can get people to make healthier choices but what we don't know is can we get them to make healthier choices and does that make a difference in their health and so this in this study we're going to be looking at health outcomes including weight blood pressure di um, and diabetes risk and all of those things so the paper we just published was on the baseline data so before the intervention started where we have shown that what people purchase at work in the cafeteria is um, uh, related or associated with their overall dietary quality so what they eat all day long not just at work And it's also associated with their prevalence of obesity, hypertension, and uh, pre-diabetes, diabetes. So that there's this, this, um, and what it's kind of the first time that we've been able to say these. This is objective food purchasing data. It's not just what you reported over the past, what you ate over the past month, but what you actually bought and um, presumably consumed is related to what you're eating outside of work and it's also related to your other health fa factors. Um, so that, that work is the, um, um, the bulk of what I'm doing. Um, I have other interests um, that have, are related to so social determinants of health, including like food insecurity, um, but those projects are um, not currently funded yet, so um, I'm waiting on that. Um, and we, I've done some work with um, some colleagues in Maine the state of Maine um, to work with grocery stores to use financial incentives um, for people, low income um, uh, communities uh, to increase fruit and vegetable purchases. So it's fascinating. I'm uh, looking forward to link all those papers in the show notes. And yeah. how do you personally design your environment towards healthy habits? Like, is there something our listeners can do to manipulate their environment consciously for them instead of having that against them? For food, um, I would say that um, the number one thing you can do for yourself, if you don't want to eat it, don't bring it into your house. Um, that's a, pr a pretty simple thing, but it's just something for people to consider. But, you know, I know I can appreciate that people have families, they have multiple people living in the house. You can't always make your environment pristine. Um, so, um, sometimes, uh, say you have kids, you maybe make a, a shelf or a drawer that's exclusively for the kids and you have to make rules with yourself to that you're, that's, you're not, you're not going to eat that food. Um, I, per, one of the things, that, one of the tips that I always give, I, we do some, um, weight loss groups here, um, at the hospital as part of what I do clinically. And one thing I tell people who work is I say, no free food, just 
free food is off limits. Don't eat the things that are sitting in the office because once you start, it's, it's, it's what's going to stop you. So if you only eat food that you bring from home or that you buy yourself, you're going to be much in a much uh, better position as far as that goes. What really has helped me is just to, when I go uh, to a restaurant with my girlfriend is just immediately ask them to not bring any bread on the table because, yeah. because I can't handle it. Like if it sits there it's, and the entire time it's asking me to, to eat it, just eliminating that, that trigger and making it a bit more harder to eat unhealthy is so important. And uh, are you teaching currently? Am I teaching? Uh, I'm teaching occasionally like um, some through re I have residents that rotate with me and um, I teach. Um, I do some lecturing at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, but not a, I don't have any courses that I teach myself. Uh, too bad. I would have loved to take one. <laughs> what's, <laughs> the, what's the story behind that? What's your uh, affiliation with Harvard? How did that uh, adventure begin to happen for you? Well, my affiliation with Harvard maybe started when I was a, an undergraduate. So I went to Harvard College um, oh. and then I went to the University of Massachusetts for medical school and then I did my residency in Chicago. Um, but after that, I came back to Massachusetts General Hospital. So as, as a, a faculty at Massachusetts General Hospital, you're, um, you're affiliated with Harvard Medical School. Um, and then you're, when you get promoted, it's through Harvard Medical School. Um, so there, it's just a relationship between a couple, some of the hospitals in Boston and the medical school. And we have the medical students will rotate through the hospitals. What was it like for you to, to study there? Because going to Harvard is still on my bucket list one day. <laughs> and so I have to selfishly ask you, what's that like? Studying at Harvard? Um, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's ama an amazing place. There's the, um, there's a lot of really smart people around. Um, you have to be, know where you're going, be self-directed a little bit. There's nobody going to be there kind of holding your hand. Um, unfortunately, we're all so young when we go to college and we don't get out of as much out of it as we'd like to, but, um, uh, but it, and Cambridge is a great place to be. It's really fun. It was, um, uh, I had a great experience there, had developed some great friends. Um, yeah, and even there is a famous professor from, from Harvard who shares the same name as you. <laughs> I'm sure you heard that a lot. I wanted to ask you, you're not related to him, right? <laughs> Edward Thorndike? Yeah. Is that what you, no. Yeah, I, my husband is. So I have my Seriously? husband. Seriously? Yeah. Ah, ah, that was Distant. crazy. I, I almost uh, didn't want you to ask because this seemed so far fetched. And uh, no. yeah, that's All amazing. The are related. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So psychology is in, in your blood of your family. I guess so. Well, it's in my husband's blood. <laughs> yeah. Regarding uh, smoking cessation, what's one uh, advice that you would give people that most of the people in your, uh, in your uh, field would disagree with? I would probably agree with most of recommendations. I think if, if for people who want to quit smoking, they should use the medications. If uh -huh. You're much more likely to quit if you use smoking cessation medications. There's no question about that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate around the e-cigarettes. I don't know if there are many people in Germany are using e-cigarettes, the, the vaping. A lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah, and so... Um, I personally have mixed feelings about the, the, the e-cigarettes. I mean, some people think that they are a good way to, for people who smoke cigarettes to quit. And that may be true. They may help people cut down. But I worry about the e-cigarettes and sort of the younger generation getting addicted to nicotine, even though they weren't going to smoke cigarettes in the first place. Um, so, but I think with smoking cessation, the medications very, really help people. You should take the medication to quit smoking. Um, even if you're not 100% ready to quit smoking, if you start varenicline, which is Chantix, um, uh, it's likely that within a couple of weeks, you'll sort of lose a little bit of your desire to smoke and it's easier to quit. I'm sure a lot of your friends probably who thought about quitting smoking ask you, about about advice what's what's that conversation like you know like i don't really have that many friends that smoke cigarettes huh. i did i i remember i did help a, um a friend of mine a few years ago who wanted to quit and, and my advice was to take the medication mm. I, I mean okay. really uh 
I think it's really important part of um, our toolbox for smoking. Um, as much as I, I, I believe in prevention and, 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 and minimizing medication use, I think that, th that they have been shown to be extremely effective. Um, and, and smoking and food, like, so, you know, as I think weight loss medications, I, I don't, I don't prescribe those to people because I think it's different. I think smoking, you, you take the medication, you quit, you, you get through that t bad time and then you're, then you're doing okay. You can be on maintenance. The problem with like a weight loss medication is you, you take it and you might lose a little bit of weight and then you stop taking it and you gain the weight back. And then you're back to where you started. And so there's no, the food is, is, is so much more difficult to manage than actually quitting smoking. Once you quit, you're in pretty good shape, like after a few months or after a year, but you can lose weight and then it's, then it can creep back on. It's really easy to kind of go backwards again. What I love so much about your proposal with the, the colors on the food system is that I believe it could change the perception of the customers about their identity because I, I dedicated like a hundred pages in my book just why it's hard to change and sometimes when you make a little decision in your life to start working out for example your entire perception of yourself changes and you make uh, new um, decisions based on the image that you now have from yourself like I'm now a healthy being apparently because I work out so this smoking afterwards doesn't fit into this this right. uh, pattern anymore and um, what I wanted to ask you is um, what's the story behind you appearing in James Clear's book like how did that turn about <laughs> you know what I, I didn't even know I was in his book until just... somebody told me yeah ah. I did no I don't know he, I, he must have t taken something from an article or something so yeah. I've never spoken to him so. Ah, that's crazy. That's crazy. He should have at least sent you a, a big thank you note because <laughs> I think I it's even seen the book. I'm not kidding. I've got to, I got to take a look at it. I've like, somebody else had told me that it was like somebody from the NIH had told me that. Remind, he re recognize this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's yours. <laughs> I've seen his art. I've seen the articles. Um, I think he had maybe something in the Washington post or something. Where I saw some of that, but I didn't know it was in the book. Mm. Yeah, that's crazy because he may not be like a, a world leading expert in, in habits, but he is one of the most famous bloggers they are right now. And the, the book has sold millions and millions of times. So, um, which I actually, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. So many people know about your work. That's amazing. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, I that's love really funny. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't know that he didn't even ask you. That's funny. I thought there was like a long process of back and forth. Can I use this study? And then phoning and all of that. Um, yeah. Okay, try to be efficient with your time. Let's move to the next section. Is uh, about happiness and success. Um, what would constitute a perfect day for you? A perfect day? Yeah. You know, like I, I'm in a phase right now where I'm, I'm actually doing a lot of work. So I kind of have been really enjoying it. And so I, you know, I hate to say that like work would be part of my perfect day, but it sort of is, I think it would be kind of a combination of, of, of having writing something that I was really proud about and then spending time having my kids home. My kids are, uh, two of them are, a little bit old, like one's just graduated from college and one's in college, the other's in high school. And then maybe, um, having a great dinner at home with all, all the, my entire family. So that that's sounds, kind of, that sounds beautiful. Oh, and, and also running always, huh? I have, I would run first thing in the morning. That's first thing in the morning. Yeah. Reminds yeah. me, I very recently I interviewed Jeffrey Cutler and he said, uh, without sports, there's no good day for him. And, um, I recently fell in, fell in love and I'm thinking about having a family with my, with my girlfriend someday. And how do you design your environment if you, if you have kids, knowing what you know now? Do you, did you make any conscious adjustments or you just do what you feel is right? You mean as far as food or just everything? <laughs> in regards to environmental psychology, I mean, when you, you know so much about behavior economics and I assume that you must see schools differently. You must see 
uh, where you send to, uh, your kid to school, for example, what you give them to eat and how, what kind of behaviors you promote. I mean, it's, it, yeah. it, it must be a bit different from a person who never touched a, a psychological paper, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, so a lot of what I've done has been as as my kids have gotten older. So, you know, I probably wasn't as much in deep when they were younger. Um, and But I think, you know, what my feeling with kids is, so I, I think that the exercise is really important. They don't have to be doing competitive sports, but they have to be physically active. Um, it's so, um, they just feel better. They're, they're better behaved. They're everything. Um, and I think, you know, I think I, I can remember this conscious time with my two older kids when my younger one was born and I was thought, mm, they, they seem to be like looking a little pudgy. They look maybe like they're getting some weight. And I was trying to, and I sort of reevaluated like what the babysitter was giving them the snack and juice. And I'm like, mm, we don't need any juice anymore. Mm -hmm. And like, we can, you know, change the snacks around. So I, you learn as you go, like what works for them. I, I personally believe that, um, structure and consistency is the, the number one most important thing for kids like they to have a, a schedule every day you know for the most part not to be totally rigid but during the school week have a structure that that they're used to that they know what they're supposed to do like I used to my kids used to have music lessons and and they would I would you know and they also played sports and so but they would I'd practice their, their guitar or their piano before we went to school in the morning. And it wasn't for a long period of time, but they knew that they had to do it. And it was done for the day. And we didn't have to fight about it later on in the day. It was just done. And I think those kind of just structures, they, they, it, it's almost comforting for them to have that kind of structure. And I guess that's probably an environmental design that I've just always kind of believed in that, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's set up, then they'll, then they'll kind of know what they're supposed to do. Um, dogs, dogs are the same way. I don't know if you have any pets, but dogs <laughs> like what you do. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Structure is so important. It's, it's like for me, when I don't manage my time, well, it's, I'm in an anxiety island and I'm for you. And, um, do you have any favorite stress reduction hacks or habits that you use for yourself? Because, you seem to be in uh, very, very productive. And how do you manage that you still have a balanced life where your family has a place where you still go run? Well, you know, I think this one is one thing that I've really learned. So I've always, I've always believed in exercise. So I do, you know, make, sh make it's always a priority. However, there were times when, like I, when I had my kids, when I was going to work and there were days I just said, you know, I, I can't do all of it. I can't exercise on these days. So I made sure that I exercised on the days that I could. I always used a baby jogger, like, so that my kids could come with me. Like it was a, a together time. Um, so, um, I, I think I, again, you know, the exercise is kind of my stress reduction. I always feel better afterwards. Um, everybody's different. Like some people do better if they can meditate or take time. Uh, and maybe I would do better if I could meditate, but I, I don't, I don't do that. Um, and I don't know, I, I talk to my kids a lot. Like, you know, that's kind of a relaxing time for me as well. Um, you know, I, my husband and I always get up early in the morning. We always have coffee and kind of talk a little bit then. So I, I think everybody's different, but I'm not, I'm not a person I, who, um, to relax, like I have to go to a spa or something. That's not me. I don't, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be at home and like hang out with the family or something. So, but I think that life evolves. Like you, you go through different times in your life where different things work. Like I could never run in the morning when my kids were little, cause I had to take them to school and get to work and all of that. But now that they they're not at home, I'm like, well, finally I can do this. This is what I this is how I wanted to structure my day. So now I can do it. So I think accepting that that life changes as you go along, and you know, work work in things the best you can, and not not beat yourself up when you can't do things perfectly. It's it's hard. Like there's a lot to manage. I agree, I agree. And if you could have, was there a time in your life where you wasn't wasn't so balanced as you are right now? If you would give yourself advice for when you were 30 years old, for example. 
like I'm not even sure I'm balanced right now. Like I, I, I think right now I'm in a phase where I do a lot of work and you know, my work, my family are priorities. And so maybe I don't like have enough, like maybe I don't see friends enough. Like that's the, you know, that's where it, it's kind of, I, I find, and it depends on what kind of person you are, but I'm just like, if I'm into something, I really like to put my everything into it. So I think the balance piece is really tough and you have to, you have to decide what, what's the most important things to you at different times in your life. And, um, so, you know, and uh, like, you know, when you do your residency in medicine, it's very extreme. Like you're at the hospital all the time. Like you're, it, there's no balance there. Um, and then that gets done and then, but then you're working and you've got kids and there's no, then, you, then you're kind of out of wax. <laughs> it's just <laughs> perfect. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I love your honesty. I love your honesty. <laughs> In, Ger in Germany right now, many doctors are protesting because there is uh, a 30% chance that you have one depressive episode while you're uh, becoming a doctor in Germany. Yeah. And you have when you graduate, you sometimes have 24-hour shifts, which is ridiculously crazy to me, knowing that those are the people who know how the body works and how important sleep is. And But my question was that, is obsession worth it because when you are bitten by this by this by this thing that you really want to focus your all effort into into this one thing is it a necessity that you make that you have not a balanced life and for some years to a degree that's a really good question and i don't know the answer to that i think that of being the the word obsessive is we you know we use it a lot Sometimes to be successful, you do need to be kind of obsessive about something like, you know, I don't like you, you have to put the time in to be successful. I, in my opinion, um, maybe some people do it without putting time in. Um, but you know, I think it, that being obsessive, it could be, it can go, it can go wrong or it can be very positive. And it kind of depends on what you're doing and what it does for you. I actually, there's a really interesting editorial in our local newspaper. Um, it was written by a Harvard um, Business School professor, I think Amy Cuddy. I don't know if you've, um, and it was about, um, it was about pursuit of happy, happiness um, versus, you know, what, what makes happiness um, and versus you know, having a sense of purpose and I'm probably not phrasing it the right way, but basically she was arguing that like our, our pursuit of happiness is, is not really what's making us feel good about ourselves, that, that having a sense of purpose and that, and I, th I would say, you know, doing something that feels meaningful for you is what makes us feel happy not in the like, oh, it's like, I'm so happy. Everything's so great. And, you know, I'm on vacation and all of this, but it's more like that you, you're doing something that feels meaningful to you. That's what, what, what gives you that, that sense of well being, I think. Um, and so to the extent that you can, um, do that, but also have those pieces in your life that are so important. Like if, if family is important to you, you have to put the time in. And there was a time in my career where I put a lot more time into my family. And so I feel like I did that. And I, I, you know, so I'm super close to my kids and my family and, and, but now they're not in the house. So I can put a little more time into my work now. I'm thinking about this a lot because it's, it's fascinating for me to talk to you because you achieved a bunch of things that I uh, am spending years and years on right now to have later in my life. And it's an interesting question to know if it's worth it, actually. And I, I talked to Professor Art Markman in, from Austin very recently, and he told that it's, it's not the, the goal that's important, but the pursuit. And that um, this is the reason why it's in, in your constitution and the first sentence that the pursuit of happiness is important and not happiness by itself um i want to be respectful with your time let's move on to the 
uh, last session of the happiness section and then go to the questionnaire. You were talking about success. What are your criteria for success? I've thought about what that is and that also has changed. I mean, I, I think I've always had certain goals. Like you always have this, when you start your career, you have this imagination of what you're going to do. And then like, when I'm having kids, I'm just like, you know what? I don't, I don't need all of this. I just, I've got to get, I got to get through the day. Um, but now that I've gotten beyond that, I'd say that, um, my, the goal for the work that I'm doing is actually to change the way we do things in the world as far as, you know, uh, like obesity prevention or, or, or to, to get to somehow move the way we do things. And, um, which is kind of a lofty goal, I guess, but in a way it's just basically saying that I want the reason that I published this work is so that it gets out there and people say, Oh, that works. Well, why don't we implement it over here? And I think to some extent, some, some of that's happening. There's some implementation, um, in different workplaces or, um, so at least to get people thinking in a different way. You certainly helped me and I'm on the other side of this planet, which is, which I think is pretty amazing because my father is, he's a heavy cigar smoker. As I told you, he used to have a humidor, which is a, a place for his cigars next to his yeah. uh, desk. And, um, I sat down with him, explained to him that if we, all thought it was a very beautiful piece of furniture for him, if he gets rid of it, he may. Uh, reduce the risk of uh, over smoking during a day and he agreed and it made sense to him and uh, without you I'm not sure I would have proposed this idea to him and I could uh, successfully redesign a little bit his environment to make a little difference and yeah, yeah. and um, let's move to the last section because uh, I have probably a thousand questions but I want to be respectful with your time um, First question of the questionnaire. What question should I have asked you? I mean, it's been kind of an interesting session because you're asking me questions that people don't usually ask me, which, you know, about questions about happiness and success and all of that, which is certainly things that I've reflected on recently. So I, it's kind of nice to be able to talk about those things. I think we've covered a lot of things. I can't think of something off the top of my head, but maybe just because I'm on the spot here i don't no, know that's that's, that, that's a good thing actually because sometimes i think when you are talking to somebody you are just so caught up in exchanging stuff you already know and um, yeah. and for me this is a very special opportunity to talk to you right now and i just wanted to make the best of it so this is just a short questionnaire if you don't know something there it's no problem we yeah. go to the next question what's a question you think people should ask themselves more often i mean i think that the question is like am i doing something that that feels meaningful to me. I think that that's an important thing because I actually think that's what, what makes people most happy. And if, and we just so, and, and it doesn't mean that like your, it doesn't mean your job has to be meaningful. Like some, somebody, sometimes you can't have a job that's meaningful, but you can do other things that are meaningful. So I just, I think that that's, and that's something I've been trying to ask myself a lot recently. Um, because I, as you get older and your kids, kids, leave the house. Um, it's really important that you're doing something because like when your kids leave, like they, they were what was meaningful and they still are, but they just don't need you as much. And so, so I think that's a good question for people to ask themselves. Last question, then you are out. If you could put a life slogan on every coffee mug in the world, what would that slogan be like? The slogan that we use in all our cafeteria is we call it the choose well, eat well program. And my, my, my study is called Choose Well 365, and I would say choose well. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and where can people find you? Yeah, I'm not on social media, so I don't... I know, uh, I tried looking for you. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, but I'm just... You know what? I'm very happy not being on social media. I don't miss it. So, yeah. I mean, people can email me if they... But, it, but to find my work, Harvard Catalyst is a... You know, there's a website there that has all the researchers it will have all the publications and grants and all that stuff harvard kettles it's in i'm so grateful for your time this really meant a lot to me i have a lot of thinking to do and a lot of papers to read apparently <laughs> <laughs> and i hope that you keep up the good work and that you know that 
your effort it was not in vain and that people actually read what you do and apparently there are millions of people aware of your work right now to uh, james clear so shout out to him as well <laughs> so, get that but yes thank you i really appreciate it it actually is kind of rewarding to talk to somebody you know across the world who has read things so i appreciate it awesome have a beautiful day thank you so much for talking to me Well, folks, this was today's episode. I hope this could add some value to you guys. This podcast still is in this experimental phase, so please let me know what you liked and didn't like. You can let me know on my blog, dannykarim.com, or on social media. As always, thank you so much for listening, and tune in next time.